So it's LME week, a uh, host of uh, leaders from the industry gathered here in London. And this morning we get these uh, headlines around uh, Illumina and the price seems volatile last week and this week on uh, North Hydro's uh, plans. Your thoughts on what's going on with Illumina and how that impacts on your business? Yes, I think we need to look at the, at the fundamentals. Um, here we're talking about the aluminium or should I say aluminium market. It's a very attractive market. I mean, it's important to step back. I mean, the, the demand for aluminium is very strong. You know, it's for the cars, it's used in cars, in aerospace, Apple Watch, iPad, iPhone, just name it. So the demand is very strong. Whatever assumption you, you're having in relation to GDP growth going forward, we would expect aluminium to grow faster. So the demand is very strong. However, it's fair to say in the last few years, there was an issue in relation to supply. But as and when China implement their restructuring program in, in a consistent way with their blue sky policies, then the supply demand balance for aluminium and therefore the attractiveness of the aluminium industry should increase. Mm. As far as Rio is concerned, is we are very well placed for in, the, in the market of aluminium. We've got the best asset in Canada, or aluminium smelters who smelt alumina. I'll come back to the alumina question. Uh, not in the first quarter of the cost curve, they're in the first decide of the cost curve. And the reason why is we've got access to um, water rights, we've got hydro-based energy over there, and therefore they are very, very competitive. Alumina, are we concerned about it? The answer is no. We are balanced globally between our operation in, mm. um, in, on the Atlantic and the Pacific, so no concern whatsoever for us. So not concerned about it. What impact is this going to have, though, on supplies of alumina for your business? Do you, do you currently have enough? Uh, we've got enough. We are totally balanced globally, as I said, between our operation in the Atlantic and the Pacific Basin. Um, there is an issue in terms of geography, but we're swapping volumes between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Are we concerned? Absolutely not. We are self-sufficient okay. in that space. Matt? J but J JS, I mean, just to ask one more question on the alumina supply issue you buy a lot of it we hear from Rusol. that company could have sanctions imposed on it again if you lose uh, another supplier a big supplier like Rusol, what does that do to prices uh, and how do you prepare for it no we won't have any issue in relation to Rusol. and the reason being is you're talking about the refinery in ireland we are on both sides of the trade so what we are doing is we are supplying the bauxite from our Guinean operations, and then we bring the alumina from the refinery. Um, we have contingency plan in place, so whatever happened to this refinery, we will be fine, we are totally covered. But in addition to that, in our discussion with the Irish government and Brussels, we are pretty, pretty confident that they will find a solution to ensure that this alumina refinery will not be stopped. So at this point in time, as far as Rio is concerned, we are totally covered in terms of alumina supply in the foreseeable future. So no, no worries whatsoever. And let me ask you a little bit about copper and what's going on there, uh, because you've talked uh, positively about copper. You like copper. One of my colleagues says you love copper. I, I love aluminium as well. Uh, OK, way. OK, <laughs> good, good. Clear. Plenty of love. Um, <laughs> let's talk about copper, though, and where you're going to find access to more copper. We're doing M&A in this space. It doesn't look as if anybody particularly wants to sell it right now and there's a lot of competition from Chinese buyers. Where are you looking? So, so let's be clear, as far as uh, copper is concerned is yes we want to grow in copper. It's a very attractive market. The reason being is the supply is very tight for the next 10 years. Um, in relation to M&A, our party line has not changed. We have a watching brief and we'll keep a watching brief on, on copper. Now at the end of the day it's all about creating value for shareholders and it's fair to say that when you look at the valuation of the recent transactions it was very good for the sellers. I'm not quite sure about the buyers. So we have a strong balance sheet. We have more or less no debt, as you know. Uh, and therefore, we will watch the market. And if there are some opportunities, we'll be there. However, in the meantime, we'll continue to pursue our organic growth options, starting with our Oyutogoi operation in Mongolia. It's a very large copper and gold deposit, which will be in the top five uh, deposit globally. We are still uh, pushing for, with our extension program in, uh, at Kennecott in the US. So we have plenty of organic options. And above and beyond that, we're spending $200 million every year on exploration. So, do we need to do M&A in the context of copper? The answer is no. However, we have the balance sheet, we have the watching brief, and we are very patient. I, I, I got to point out a chart that Hillary just threw together for us, JS. It shows net longs and copper, and I think the market is is looking in this aspect more at the demand side than the supply side. We were very long, or hedge funds were very long throughout 2017, the beginning of this year. They uh, dropped down to net shorts for a bit, but now they've turned back around to net longs. Um, I think they were concerned, hedge funds were, about the Chinese economy 
and the trade war uh, and, and that affect the effect of that on the demand side for copper. How do you feel about the trade war and the Chinese economy right now, considering how important that is for, you know, Dr. Copper, as we as we always refer to it? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, you know, for us, China, I'm talking about Rio Tinto, or the mining industry is very important. I mean, China accounts for more than 50 percent of all the trades we are doing. Now, am I concerned about the Chinese economy at this point in time? The answer is absolutely no. We've got multiple entry points into China. We sell iron ore, we sell bauxite, we sell aluminum, we sell copper. And today I can tell you all our other books are absolutely full. So yes, the Chinese economy is slowing down. We know that. At the same time, is it is clear that the Chinese government has decided to put more stimulus into the system, especially in the context of the provincial level. Uh, today, if I look at the infrastructure pipeline in China, it's totally full. So are we concerned about China at this point in time? Absolutely not. Now, in relation to trade wars, um, there has been no impact whatsoever in our business. And you saw, in, in, including the, between the Canada and the mm -hmm. U.S. in relation to NAFTA, trade wars, as far as Rio is concerned, today, mm. no impact whatsoever. So no impact. And I heard the same from the Antofagasta CEO. Uh, Ivan Ariagada was saying the same, no impact from the trade wars. So, I mean, what worries the boss of a, of a big mining business at the start of LME week? Anything? Are there worries? Oh, I've got lots of worries every day of the week, don't worry, you know, we just need to make sure that all operations are safely run, that we improve every day, uh, that we push our productivity agenda to the next level, we provide technology. At the end of the day is, if I step back. What's the big is threat though? Is it the, is it the global trade war? Is that the big threat to the business? At, at this point in time, the answer is no. Right. I think the, the real threat for us is really to make sure that we have a very resilient business. We acknowledge there is uncertainty in the marketplace. We acknowledge there is volatility in the marketplace. And I'm just making sure that our 40,000 people are working hard to build a resilient business, which is about cost position, about having the right product, the right relationship with our customers, and last but not least, having a strong balance sheet. If we get it right, and we got it right, all value over volume stretch is working. Remember, last year we delivered $10 billion of cash return to our shareholders. And for the first six months of this year, we delivered $7.2 billion. So the strategy is working. We need a strong, resilient, sustainable business. That's what we're doing every day, and it's working. JS, I want to ask about um, your energy needs, your energy concerns, especially longer term in this energy intensive business, you know, mining, smelting, when I think of all of that, you've got to uh, have fuel to power these machines and, and, the, and these uh, plants. H how do you see energy or energy concerns shaping out? I mean, what are your biggest inputs? What are the costs looking like? And how do you see that changing over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, so the first point I would like to make is two thirds of our power is provided through a renewable base. Um, so in that sense, we are less exposed than the, most of my peers in relation to energy. Um, are we pushing hard in order to improve the productivity and the energy efficiency of our assets? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, but you know, as I said, two thirds of our uh, source of energy is renewable already. So we'll keep pushing. Energy is something important for us. Um, we have productivity programs. Um, that is part of the reason why inflation is coming back, but at this point in time, are we overly concerned? The answer is no. Uh, talking about more sustainable business, talk to me about the opportunities in electric cars for some of the things that you pull out of the ground. That's why we love copper, that's why we love aluminium. So we believe in the EV revolution. And then back to your question of your colleagues in relation to China. We have no, do that, no doubt in our mind that China will lead mm. the charge in relation to EV, and therefore there will be more and more demand in China in relation to copper in relation to aluminium and therefore bauxite and alumina. And last but not least, new minerals in order to support the battery technology. And some of the activities we are taking uh, as we speak in relation to, our, for example, our YADA project to produce lithium for the battery technology. So we love it and we believe we are very well positioned. OK, I mean, when I spoke to Antofagasta earlier on, they were talking about a tenfold increase in the amount of copper that will be going into the car industry over the next 10 years or so. Is that the kind of uh, growth story you're looking the at? The growth story is pretty significant. But the question is really to position ourselves in the best possible way, which is at the end of the day, the right cost, the right product, the right relationship with our customers.